then we decided that usage was changing and that there, there were two schools of thought in the current in the dictionaries that existed at that point that they were either very prescriptive and said you must do this or they said nothing at all and so we wanted to take something that was middle of the road and made sense for today's user. I have to show something because this is interesting to me. I just happened to open it up at K and it, it seems to me in, in the very beginning there besides the big K and the small K and there's all the rest of the, the visual impact that even if you don't like words this much, uh, even if you happen to not even like a dictionary, um, it's one of those things that you can open up nearly like a book and all of a sudden just get sort of sweet talk, I guess maybe it's a word I want to use, and getting interested this in it. This is something else we added, was giving the history of every letter from the earliest Phoenician form to the modern form. So you get the history of the words, you get the, w the history of the letter. And we also put in interesting folk etymologies of words. For example, I learned in looking up in that dictionary that the word bikini was coined about the time that they were doing the atomic tests in the Bikini Atoll in the Pacific. And the impact of the bathing suit was like the impact of the bomb, and that's where we get the word. Or the word posh, Is it for that example. that new, the word bikini? Mm hmm relatively. And so yeah. if you're looking up a, w a word, the word bikini, in a dictionary that's, say, 30 years old, it wouldn't even be in there. Probably Except not. as a bikini at all. Yes, right. But other interesting things, for example, posh, I learned, uh, is an acronym for port side out starboard home because the most expensive cabins in the, for the ships going between England and India were the port side out starboard home. And this sort of interesting word information is included. And I think that's what children particularly enjoy. That, and of course, we do trace words back to their Indo-European roots. And this is a fascinating subject because the word uh, mother begins with an M in every language in the world because it's assumed that there was a, a prototype language spoken in uh, southwestern Europe and western Asia about 6,000 years ago, which explains this. Do I hear you telling me that in a way the good modern dictionary such as this both for adults and students is really in a way nearly a little bit of an encyclopedia? Yes, I think it is. The concept of what a dictionary is has changed. And the usage notes uh, that I wanted to tell you a little bit about are tied in with this. What we did was to assemble a panel of the foremost users of American English today, people from all walks of life, newspaper people, uh, writers, newscasters, and we update the panel just as we update everything in our dictionary. And we've just added just 12. Just average people that aren't the other things that you people mentioned? People like William Buckley and it's Arthur Schlesinger and Pauline Kael. <laughs> and um, Red Smith, uh, all sorts of people, Truman Capote. They're, for the most part, of course, very well-known users of American English. And we ballot them on a regular basis on questions of usage, such as what's the difference between bi-monthly and semi-monthly. It could mean getting six or 24 magazines a year if you don't know the difference. Or what's the difference between flaunt and flout, or comprise and compose. Uh, many of these questions, where do you use an apostrophe? How do you use a hyphen? And all of this information is in there. There's a usage, no usage note that, that explains what the panel felt should be correct in both speech and writing, recognizing that we make Barbara, distinctions. I have to say one thing, though. The thing that I mentioned in the first place was that in the beginning, a dictionary was really something that, that really was something that you didn't want to spend any time with. And when you talk about your panel, they are the very able, the, the word freaks, as, you, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, the people that love words, they like to read, they have beautiful vocabularies. So between these people that already like words, there are literally millions of people out there that still won't like the dictionary if it becomes too um, sophisticated, too esoteric. Well, that's what I think is exciting about this concept of a dictionary, that it can be for everyone. For example, a housewife using that dictionary can find the uh, stitches for cruel work. She can use it for that. Or she can find things like buttonhole stitch if she's looking it up. Um, someone who sails can find all the nautical hitches pictured and could actually uh, make them look up uh, Bolin, for example. Okay, um, you be looking, you be talking while I look up. Uh, I'll look up feather stitch. Dictionary everywhere. Providing the I can find it. <laughs> biologists could look all up right. bacteria and find all the strains pictured. Or a chemist, there you have the, uh, the periodic table of the elements. Well, and this is what I said, that in a way it becomes um, nearly like an encyclopedia. A right. quick all in all one. All purpose, right. All purpose Instead one. of needing five reference books, you can reach for one. But uh, 
it's fascinating to look at some of the letters that have poured in. We have over 5,000 letters in our file uh, from educators, and of course we have many letters just from the man in the street, which is, explaining. which is the one I'm interested in, and from librarians, uh, and from students, I and hope. from students. Yes, we we do, and uh, we get very amusing letters. Like one professor who wrote and said, "I hate your book, and I hate Houghton Mifflin for publishing it. I meant to look up one word, and I spent the whole night reading the thing." All right, well, that's and, what I was talking about, and, and it seemed to me in looking in the adult one, but particularly the dictionary for school use. It, it seemed to me that this was a different. You could fall into it looking for one word. The same thing that happens to me when I go to a good encyclopedia, and all of a sudden you're hooked. You're hooked for hours at a time. That's right. And and maybe this, if this can be developed in schools. Now let's go to the elementary. I was just going. You dictionary. asked me about the whether the average person can get hooked on a dictionary. Uh, uh, one of the people in my department went into the Harvard Coop at Christmas time and found a little old lady carrying out seven copies of the dictionary, and he said. Uh, what in the world are you going to do with seven copies? Because they're heavy. And she said, she said, your dictionary is like a bowl of popcorn. She said, you take one piece and you have to keep going back. And she said, uh, she said she had a copy that she received as a premium from a bank, and it was on her coffee table. And her nephew came and, and spent the it. evening reading it and took yeah. it. And she said, if it's good enough for one nephew, it will solve all my Christmas present problems. And so, it, so it went from there. And and this is what makes it fun. But I. Let's like talk, talk about, about the elementary one. school one because yes. the school dictionary and you know schoolhouses about schools and all the rest. Now this is for grades three to nine, and um, it's a brand new dictionary, and very exciting I think for several reasons. First of all, it's based on a million-dollar study of school materials nationwide, and in the past, intermediate dictionaries have really been watered down adult dictionaries in which editors guessed which words children would need to know. This one was produced because that one was such a great success. Now you have the uh, older edition of the dictionary. It now has a red jacket and uh, we have added over a hundred entries and changed a number of maps and our uh, philosophy is like Volkswagen. It's the same only it's better. But that one outsold Love Story, The Godfather, and Portnoy's Complaint. It was 39 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. That's and it was pretty, just that's, that's so generally popular. Right. Oh, well my favorite uh, piece of promotion that I read was that the first printing alone took enough paper to, strep, uh, to stretch a five-foot strip three-quarters of the way around the globe. That's a lot so. of paper, <laughs> but I think that it still comes back to the fact you can have it printed, you can use the paper, but unless down People in elementary it. schools with third through the eighth grade or whatever, you have to create the love, right? students develop a taste for words and for the fact that, that it, they really are the magic things that open right. a lot of doors. Well, we um, sort of went backwards in that sense because we, dis we started with the adult, and that one was successful, so we decided we'd do the same thing with the school edition. So we produced this um, in April of 72. It had its first appearance. And um, as I said, we did this computer study in surveying school materials nationwide in public, parochial, and private schools. We took 10,000 passages of 500 words each. Now, the uh, study was done through American Heritage. They handle the editorial end of the dictionaries, and Houghton Mifflin distributes them. But um, all of this material was compiled and then fed into a computer. And the computer came up with 700,000 citations from that 5 million word sampling. And these represented 87,000 different words. 87,000 different, different words, words that from should the initial be sampling. in an elementary. Let's no. go to slides for a minute, because right. I, I, I think that it's sort of interesting at this time to, to know where we've been. In, uh, this in is the 1873 edition of Noah Webster's Dictionary. His first major dictionary was in um, 1828. And but there this were is, pictures. There were pictures. This then. is, I think, is important. This is the Turkey page from the initial Merriam-Webster 1873 edition. And then we and went this from that to, to that, that, that yes. sterile thing that, that I looks can like remember. A telephone book. <laughs> looks like a telephone book. And who wants to look and at it? And it's difficult to read. Now, this is the American Heritage Adult Dictionary. And on that page, there's an Audubon line drawing of a turkey, the country turkey, a turkey buzzard. And you can see where the concept has been expanded through illustration. And we've essentially gone back to what Noah Webster had And then in mind. here we are with a computer. Yes, this is, is the citation file at American Heritage, which keeps track of language on computer tape. So that we have, finally, the modern technology and science applied to the field of language. And this, of uh, course, is, as I was saying, what makes the school dictionary so exciting. Because the words in this represent student reading. For example, if Huckleberry Finn were taught nationwide at eighth grade, 
The words from Huckleberry Finn are in this dictionary, and the illustrating sentences are from Huckleberry Finn. We were able, through the use of the computer, to identify not only the words the children encounter, but the grade level at which they first encounter them. So, for example, we found that children first encounter the word metamorphosis at the third grade level. So we worded the definition for metamorphosis for the understanding of a third grade reader. So one little boy said to me, I love that dictionary because it doesn't explain words with other words I don't know. And I thought, aha, we did exactly what we wanted to do. To. All right, but let's talk about in this fast-moving world, uh, with the new words that come for many reasons, um, how do you keep it up to date? How often do you add the new Our words? Our dictionaries are the only ones set by computer, which means we can realign the pages very simply and add or delete words. For the adult dictionary... Now, uh, stop a minute. You're talking so fast. <laughs> they are set, quote on, by computer. By computer. This means that the actual typeset is, is done, done by, by computer. computer. Yeah. So we can realign pages. Now, what this means is, in the adult dictionary, we are now in our 10th printing. We've made over 3,000 changes since 1969. Um, we're we, like four years, not yes, yet. Yes, in four years, years, we have done 10 printings, and we have made changes in every one of them. So we do add words. And in the school dictionary, using the computer to study language was fascinating. You mentioned how the, the language changes. We discovered um, a cultural slant to language, which was just fascinating to me. Um, for example, children encounter the word time more than any other common noun, although they encounter words the most for any uh, noun. They encounter is more than any other verb, Saturday and Sunday more than other days of the week, white more than any other color, then it goes red, green, black. They see Chinese more than Russian. They see Republican more than Democrat. They Who did see the research on all this? This is what the computer uh, turned up because it showed us the frequency of occurrence. So, for example, in textbooks, in, textbooks, and in, in everything that the children see in schools, everything from the weekly reader to the newspaper to the Reader's Digest to the novels to the science workbooks, we had a compilation of all the materials they encounter and then the order of frequency of words. So, what fascinated me recently, I was thinking to myself, what's the most important word uh, in the English language for Americans today? And the piece was the obvious answer. So I went and looked up in the study and discovered that children see the word war three times more often than they see the word peace. So that kind of piqued my fancy. So I went to look at the new entries added in the latest edition of the adult dictionary because the fact that we use computers and that we have taken the scientific approach means that we are reporting on culture and society and language. We're not slanting it. We are reporting what's there. I discovered that of the new entries, 10% had to do with war or hostility, and not one word had anything to do with peace or harmony. Well, but that's the society is, imposing its yes. own pressures, and, and you in the dictionary reporting book business it. are reporting on right. it. Right. In other words, if more, word, more new words were coined that had to do with peace, if words referring to peace turned up more often in the newspapers, there would be more words. You know, about. let's go back to spelling for a minute, because this is really where we get back again. Um, a man in industry or business, and he has a new secretary. And she can't and spell. And he's saying again, <laughs> well, here we go, you know, every, every new secretary I got, and she cannot spell. Um, do you think that instead of just calling English, English spelling, creative writing, and so forth, um, instead of lumping it all into language arts, if there is a new effort to teach spelling and the enjoyment of words? I think it's extremely important. I think this is where it begins, with making children love language, with making them aware of words. It doesn't do any good at all to have a reference book or a teacher unless the child has been motivated to go to the dictionary when, it, there's, when there's a question. This starts in the home. It starts with having the dictionary on the coffee table or in the dining room. It starts with the parents looking up words, because this is where the attitude is first fostered. And I've had many parents say to me that they keep the dictionary on the kitchen table, or they keep it right where the living center is, not up on a shelf. And this was our whole idea, that a dictionary should be something that you keep at your elbow and you take with you and you, um, you use. A used dictionary is the best dictionary, I think. You used the term when we first met last fall of there's such things as word freaks, and you're one of them. Um, I have to ask you in your own home and family, did you always have a dictionary out? Um, we used a dictionary regularly. I would say that the, the love for words has grown with me. I was an English major, and I taught English, and I was an English editor, and it's something that has become greater as the years have gone by.
But yes, there was an interest in language in my own home. Do you think that um, in teachers' colleges now, because you spend a lot of time on campus, um, let's talk about the average English major, it seems to me, usually goes off in a field of American literature, French literature, or a lot of reading or creative writing. What is the thrust in teachers' colleges and university right now right. to introduce this specific of helping teachers get this going early? I think in the past decade we've had a movement away from the specifics of English. I think we have had a tendency to move away from using specific references to teaching how to use them. And I've noticed this with prospective teachers, that they don't teach dictionaries, or they don't know how to teach dictionaries because no one has taught them. It's the thing that most teachers, myself included, hated to do most, because it's easy to teach something you're very familiar with, and it's difficult to go in and teach something without instruction. I've noticed that when I walk into the chairman of an English department and say, I'd love to come and give a presentation to your students about dictionaries, about how to use them and what's exciting about language, There's, they're very receptive. They're extremely okay, let, interested. Let's be specific. We've got a few minutes. Um, Barbara, how do you teach a dictionary? Well, I usually begin by talking about the history of words and uh, about the fact that English is um, the second most spoken language in the world, that we have over a million words. And one of words. the most complicated yes. of all. We have over a million words in the language, but only around 600,000 have ever made a dictionary. We could publish a 20-pound dictionary with just the chemical compounds of carbon. So how do we decide which words are the most important and which ones should be in a dictionary? How do we encourage people to use a dictionary when there is one dictionary sold in the U.S. for every 25 bathtubs? How do we convince people it's as important to be literate as it is to be clean? Um, and then I go back and I talk about the new words that have come into the language, how different movements have influenced language. For example, ecology. We added for the first time biodegradable ecosystem and recycle. They weren't in any other comparable dictionary. Fashion. We added bell bottoms, pantyhose, pantsuit, tie dyed, uh, minority groups, Chicano, Afro, soul, groovy. Um, you can pick any subject. Um, medicine. We added open heart. We added vasectomy which was interesting because children had to see that with a certain frequency before it was important enough to be included in the dictionary. Um, you can pick feminism. We added sexist, sexism, the expanded meaning of chauvinism and Ms. We have the first dictionary that ever contained Ms. You got for a Ms. new way? <laughs> yes. How, how do they do pig? I mean, this has become a colloquialism in the last five years that has a whole different feeling. I'd have to look it up. <laughs> All right, you go ahead. I'm going to look. And I just assume I've memorized the whole thing. All right, thing. You go, you go. I'll look up in mind but here. What but I think mostly. is fascinating is how the different concerns of society are mirrored in language. And I always enjoy talking most about how culture and language are interrelated. For example, an Eskimo has no word for war. A Hawaiian has no word for weather. When a Hawaiian gives directions, he says Maukai or Mauka, meaning towards the, and I've probably got it mixed up, toward the ocean or toward the mountains instead of uh, north, south, east, know, and west. My problem is that I don't have the alphabet down <laughs> straight, you know. The you Sioux Indians, I know you're interested in Indians, yeah. they have no vulgar slang in their language. Um, For them. I've been told that the Hopi Indians don't have to say a glass of water or a pitcher of water, they can say a water because they don't conceive of that as being something that has to be surrounded. I just answered my own question on pig, which it has, any of several mammals of the fa family and so forth, informal, a person regarded as being pig-like, greedy, or gross, and then it goes on to other things, so that they have not put in here also well, you have, the co colloquial I, negative phrase uh, of I'm chauvinist, not, you know. I'm not sure that that's so, because I know there is um, at chauvinist um, an entry to that effect, but I think that you have an older edition. Yeah, as oh, I said, sure we keep adding. Be. I have a list here of just some of the new words that have gone in uh, to the well, latest the edition of that fatty. one. That's another question that I want to ask you. Um, what's in, like, you know, in the spring of 1973, um, who's going to decide if it's going to be out. good enough to still be important to be in a, in a dictionary Well, this is why now? there is a subjective element included. We examine how often a word appears and whether it looks as if it's a legitimate word in the language. For example, machismo is one word that kept turning up. It turns up, say, for the first time in the New York Times, we have a citation of that. Then it might be the New Yorker. Then Mary Hemingway used it in the Ladies Home Journal, I think it was. And you see more and more citations. Well, when a word has established itself, 
then we say it's in. And it was amusing that the editors uh, at American Heritage said that hot pants wouldn't go in until they had seen significant uh, evidence of the, the durability of did the it, word. Did it go it's in? in? It's in the school dictionary. Okay, I looked it up. so but then by the time, like three years from now, maybe they're out, so it'll be taken out. There again, it would depend on whether or not enough literature contained the term. For example, a word might be used, it might be, say, neat or, or cool might have been a very popular slang term at one time. Well, if we're still reading a great deal of material that would contain the term, then we need to contain Okay, it. let me go at it the other way, because anybody can pick up the slang, and most slang words, for heaven's sakes, we can spell. They're usually like three or four or five letters. But I think the importance of lots of people, they want to know how can we, that, that are maybe more than one syllable. The best way to learn to spell is to become excited about reading. The more you read, the more words you encounter, the more words you go back to the dictionary to find. I give out bookmarks whenever I visit schools and they've got spaces on them for children to look up, to write down words that puzzle them in their everyday reading and sends them back to the dictionary. This is the way to learn to spell, to be exposed to language and not just to use uh, 10 words <laughs> to the exclusion of all others, which I think is what could happen in our language. I think there's such a uh, tendency to be redundant, to pick a few um, slang words and, and overplay them to the point that we're we kill our language, we'll kill our here. culture. That's it, exactly. Do you think, back to, and I ask you the specific question of how do you teach the dictionary when you're at universities or colleges? Well, there are five main reasons that someone turns to a dictionary. Spelling, pronunciation, um, meaning, usage, and etymology, in that order. And it's very easy to, uh, to examine how we answer those five needs in a dictionary, what information is there, how to look for it. And of course, ours are easier to use because we've put everything at the point of entry. If you look up cougar, it doesn't say see mountain goat. And you yeah. keep going to, uh, <laughs> to Pullman, and you never yeah. find out what it means. To Pullman is right. We have to end up there. Uh. Right. So um, it's very easy to take that approach, the five reasons for turning to a dictionary, and then what's there to answer those needs. Um, I'd like to have, a, have you share with the audience the word goatee. This is my favorite it. I know entry. it's your favorite. <laughs> I didn't want you to get off the show without <laughs> being your favorite thing. I just wanted to show that a dictionary can have a sense of humor. This is showing the etymology of the word goatee. And here we have a goat, uh, goatee, and here we have one of our um, people who work works at American Heritage with his goatee. And a few and of a our friends looks here at, at KOMO <laughs> Right. I'll show you just another entry quickly, um, if we had that one long enough, just to show how a picture can expand a concept. Here is that three-shaped figure, which you see in clover. And there's a clover, the, the flower, clover leaf on a highway, and club on a playing card. Now, the child who looks at that page knows a lot more about that figure. You can look up anything. I've learned all sorts of things. I looked up skunk and, and saw what one looks like spraying. Strawberry, and you find the flower as well as the, uh, the uh, uh, fruit. Um, you can look up cartoon and find a Peanuts cartoon. You look up animated cartoon and it shows you how one actually works. Binary numeration system, there's a chart that, that explains it for the child. All kinds of math figures. Uh, in the adult dictionary, there's a map for every country in the world with population when, when I ask you just like a few easy questions on words, you just <laughs> go off like a Fourth of July balloon because you really are so excited because about words. Because it is but, an exciting subject. Um, and, uh, Obviously, you're sold on the whole idea of words and the use of dictionary and the importance of them. Uh, do you really think in this decade, in 1970, that, that schools also specifically are, are beginning to make a different kind of commitment to yes. dictionary I use? have noticed this year that there is a change, uh, a, a definite change. We have had for the last few years a soft market for dictionaries, and this has been all dictionaries. And I think there are several reasons for it. One, the professors in college colleges have not been recommending or requiring dictionaries. I think that there is a change here. They're beginning to realize it's important. And when they start recommending them, the students will again start buying them. And um, I think that's an important factor. I think that the economy has influenced dictionary buying. When a large industry um, or a major operation has to spend an extra thousand dollars to buy dictionaries, and we have a soft economy, they're not going to. Thank um, you, Barb. You're it's welcome. Very, it's, it's too fast. I'd like to say Barbara Twomley did give me the 13 toughest spelling words. There are. I'm not going to tell you if you want to send in the card. I will share them with you on the 13 words that are most often missed when someone is spelling them. As I said, these two programs have had to do with English and schools. And I hope that you go flying off to your dictionary 
very soon to see how much they've changed since you last looked. See you next week.